Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to another morning of EPEW 2021. So nice to see some of these familiar names we got on here. So today we are super excited. We get to have Charlie Rizzuto with us. Um, but before we have him get started, a few little things. Uh, we are going to ask for you to remain muted during the presentation unless we ask you to do otherwise. If you have questions, go ahead and drop them into the chat and we'll make sure we, to get those to Charlie during the presentation. Uh, as you come in, go ahead and put in your name and where you're from so we know who all is joining us from all around. It is tech that we're using here, so in case something does go wrong, hold tight, check your email for some reason it crashes or whatnot, and we'll get back to you that way. If you are going to be using social media to push this out, please make sure you are using uh, tagging us in that in the hashtag EPEW2021 and hashtag EPEW family. That would be awesome. Um, other than that, uh, at the end of the session today, we will be putting the link into the chat of the certificate of attendance for you to have access to that. So we will make sure to get that to you. If you don't get it during that time, don't worry, it will be emailed to you at the end of the workshop. But for today, we're so excited to have Charlie coming to us with Spring Forward with Backward Design. And here he is. You're still muted, Charlie. Forgot I muted myself. So thank you for the introduction. Um, and I wanna thank everybody for coming. Um, so the title of the presentation is Spring Forward with Backwards Design. So what we're going to do today is go through the backwards design model a little bit. Um, I teach secondary physical education. So a lot of what I do in this presentation is going to come from that lens. Um, but the model in and of itself obviously is applicable to all grade levels and not just physical education, but any teaching discipline, right? So if you teach health education as well, um, the, the way you go about utilizing the model might change a little bit, um, but the model essentially remains the same. Um, if you use backwards design, um, some of this may be familiar to you. Um, some of it I hope is new to you so you could get something out of the presentation. This is um, how I go about constructing my learning sequences in physical education class. Um, just a quick thumbs up. You can see my screen. I'm sharing. I'm good. All right. Thank you. Um, so, oh, and I left some time at the end for conversation. If you have a question, like Jessica said, throw it in the chat. They could toss it to me. I could answer it in real time. Um, but I presented a very similar session at the SHAPE conference, and there was a lot of conversation um, at the end, which was, which was good. A lot of good feedback, but also a lot of, a lot of conversation. Um, I presented at the SHAPE conference virtually, obviously. Um, so there was a lot of activity stuff that I had built into this presentation when I first put it together, thinking maybe where I presented it would be in person. Um, but obviously some of that stuff has, has been taken out because we're virtual. If you are thinking about attending the SHAPE conference next year, um, I'm gonna put this session back in. And if we're in person, some activity stuff will be incorporated into it as well, right? So just because you're getting it today, if you happen to be at SHAPE, um, or at New York State Aford in the future. Um, come by anyway, because it's gonna be a little bit different, right? A lot of the same stuff, but also some new stuff is gonna be incorporated in there as well. So I wanna start um, by talking a little bit about what this presentation is not, right? And I just alluded to it a little bit. Um, this presentation is not an activity-based presentation. And I apologize if I look off to the side, I just have my, my uh, slides on a different monitor. Um, but this is not an activity-based presentation. Um, we're going to talk a lot today about good teaching, right? Because utilizing the backwards design model and some of the other things that we discussed during this presentation, um, in my opinion, um, but I would also say in a lot of people's opinion, and there's some research to back it up, that it's, it's just what good teaching looks like, right? It's what good teachers do when we create learning sequences for our classes and for our students. So how do I view activity? And I know it's probably similar to the way a lot of you view activity, but for me, I always say activity is the vehicle and joy drives the car, right? So we start to think about and talk about a meaningful PE experience, right? We talk about joy and delight and all of those things. Um, activity is the vehicle to bring students to whatever it is that we want them to learn that day or in that learning sequence or, or through our curriculum during the course of the school year from K to 12, however you look at it. 
Activity is the vehicle, right? Um, my units aren't really traditional units. Again, as like I'm sure a lot of you uh, construct your stuff as well. I don't call them units. I call them learning sequences just to get away from the language to also create a different mindset for both myself and, and my students. Um, so we're not really in a basketball unit or a volleyball unit or a chook ball unit. In my PE classes, I try to play a different game every day or every few days, even though the learning during the course of that sequence will remain relatively the same, right? And we're gonna get into that a little bit later. Um, but we're learning something in a unit or during over a period of time, and we change the games as readily as we can, as often as we can, um, rather than being stuck in one activity or in one activity for a longer period of time. So it says on, this, on the screen, the activities that we choose serve as vehicles, bringing our students to meaningful learning experiences in physical education. And if you've never really looked at it through that lens before, I want you to remember activity is the vehicle, joy drives the car, right? So activity is gonna bring our students to the learning and we want the joy and the fun to be what's driving that vehicle, what's driving that game and that activity. So backwards design model in physical education, right? So I don't know if you've heard this phrase before or not, I'm going to assume that a bunch of you have, right? Um, but I'm gonna say it anyway, cause we don't wanna make assumptions. So when we talk about backwards design, we begin with the end in mind. So we start at the end of our learning sequence and then we work our way backwards, right? So when I create a learning sequence for my students utilizing the backwards design model with that statement in mind, starting with the end in mind, where do we begin? Well, we begin with the grade level outcome or the state standard. So if you're looking at the national standards, right? We have the national standards, we have the grade level outcome. In my state, we just rewrote our standards um, a couple of years ago, this was our first year rolling them out of a three year rollout. We have our own grade level outcomes, right? We adopted some of the national standards. We have um, our own standard in there that's specific to our state. And then we have GLOs for each individual standard, just like the national document does. So I always start with that grade level outcome. That's what I'm teaching. That's what the students are learning. So that's where I begin. After the grade level outcome, I create the summative assessment. Whoop, sorry, I didn't mean to click there. Um, so what is the summative assessment? So the summative assessment comes at the end of the learning sequence. And it's what the students or how the students are going to tell us and show us that they've learned whatever it is that they're expected to learn during that sequence, right? So the summative assessment, as I'm sure a lot of you know, um, summarizes or sums up, or it's the sum of all the learning that occurred during that sequence. So I start my, with my grade level outcome, and then I create my summative assessment for the learning uh, sequence. I want to know how I'm going to assess my students before I figure out exactly how I'm going to teach the sequence and what activities I'm going to take them through. And then I write the essential question. We're going to talk about essential questions in a second. Um, but essentially, essentially, an essential question, the way I use an essential question is it's the bridge from the first lesson all the way through to the summative assessment. We're gonna talk again about essential questions in a little bit more detail in a second, but that's the order that I start with in terms of creating a learning sequence for my students. Grade level outcome, choose it, here's what I'm teaching, here's what they're going to learn. How am I going to gauge their learning at the end? That's the summative assessment. Then I'm going to write the essential question. Now, essential questions. Again, we're gonna talk about them a little bit later on, but I wanna say this now. Sometimes I have one essential question that lives over the course of the entire learning sequence. Sometimes I have a couple or a few, depending on what I'm teaching and depending on how long that learning sequence is gonna go for, okay? Um, essential questions don't really exist inside a, an individual lesson. Really good questions exist inside of individual lessons, um, but typically essential questions last over a period of time. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in a second. So we go from the sequence, right? Constructing the sequence, the broader stuff, and we kind of segue over into constructing individual lessons. And again, I love analogies. I love quick things that can help me rem remember my approach to what I do. So I always think of Big Mac versus Iron Mike, right? And if you, as you can see on the screen, we're talking about something that's collaborative or comparative, not combative. So when we say this versus that, it's not a fight between the two. It's kind of, um, collaborating between the two or comparing the two sides of the graphic that I'm gonna put back up on the screen in a second. So Big Mac versus Iron Mike is our macro, our big stuff, and our micro, our smaller things. So the learning sequence is the big stuff, the things that are going to exist and unfold over time 
is the Big Mac stuff, the Iron Mike stuff, is the individual lessons. And this parallels really, really nicely, um, in my opinion, if you disagree, tell me. If you have a better way, tell all of us. Um, so in an individual lesson, where do we start? Well, we start with the mastery objective. So the grade level outcome or the standard is what the students are going to learn over time. The mastery objective is what they're going to learn today. After I create my mastery objective and I write my mastery objective, next is I create the formative assessment. And again, it mirrors what's on the left-hand side. Grade level outcome, summative assessment, what they're gonna learn over time, how I'm gonna know that they learned it at the end of the learning sequence. Mastery objective, what they're going to learn today, formative assessment, how am I going to know when they leave the class today that they learned what it was um, intended for them to learn today. We have our essential question on the macro side. On the micro side, we have the what, why, how, right? So our essential question bridges or almost serves as a bridge from the beginning to the end of the learning sequence. And our what, why, how helps us frame the individual lesson, okay? Um, and I'm sure a lot of you have experience with some, if not all of these things. I don't know how many of you um, look at your learning sequences through that lens and take this specific approach in designing it. But what I want to do now is show you another visual, right? Like I said, I love visuals and I love like little phrases that help keep me focused and um, centered in my approach to, to what I try to do with my students. So I, for a long time, had this image of a power strip in my head when I thought of learning sequences. Because to me, we could kind of label each element, and we're going to do this as we go, of that power strip um, with pieces of the backwards design model that we just went through, right? So for right now, let's say that that entire power strip was the learning outcome. It's the grade level outcome. And we're going to break it down a little bit more as we go, but to keep it simple to start, think of each, I don't even know what they're called. What are they called? The sprockets, things where you plug things into the outlet, I guess, um, as the individual lessons. So we're going to plug our individual lessons into each um, outlet, and we're going to fill that outcome, that learning sequence with our individual lessons. So I'm going to share this out at the end. I'm gonna put it in the chat at the end. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, it's specific to high school, but I was lucky enough to be asked, and I'm sorry that I, I rolled around a little bit. I don't, I don't know, I very rarely sit, so I, I move. Um, but I was asked over the summer with a couple of, a couple, a bunch of other teachers, uh, Sari Gitcha Hartman, uh, Carrie Bullis, Joe Bailey, a bunch of other teachers, Allison Relier, um, to help collaborate on this priority outcome document. And it served a very specific purpose, again, for high school PE teachers. And that purpose was to, during the pandemic, whether you're in person, you're remote, you're hybrid, to create a list of priority outcomes that can be taught no matter how you're teaching. And with those priority outcomes, we had essential questions and some other things in there to help you create learning sequences. Now, hopefully we're coming out of the pandemic, hopefully things are getting back to normal, but a document like this one could serve as a good aid and a good reminder um, for creating really strong learning sequences with, with, our, with our students. And like I said, this is specific to the high school level. After we started brainstorming this, I think we met three or four times. Um, Shape put out their priority outcome document. And what we saw was a lot of it mirrored, right? So um, that was good, right? We liked that a lot of it mirrored. But what I'm gonna show you is um, when you create your backwards design model, right? We have these outcomes, but we don't wanna give our students like a grade level outcome or a standard. So um, what Sarah Get Your Hartman did, and I think Lisa Smith, I think they collaborated on it together, was they took that document that we created and they created another document, basically turning the outcomes into themes. And I could share both of those documents out with you. But one thing that I wanted to bring to your attention and why I referenced those documents, not only because I'm gonna share them with you as a way to, uh, as a resource for you to have, but to show you now how, oh, I'm sorry. This is the, um, the themed document, right? So these were the nine themes that Sarah and Lisa came up with, right? So building community, getting your daily dose, finding your fun, maximizing, uh, maximizing challenge, moving to manage stress, seeking adventure, empowering others, which was probably my favorite thing to teach this year, um, taking action, and then at the end, a health fair. So those were the, the, the nine themes. 
But this is what I really wanted to show you. So we have our outcomes, but then when we bring things to students, we don't want to bring them as outcomes or as mastery objectives. So we change the language and we change um, the wording and we change the delivery on how we bring it to our kids. So if you look on the left-hand side, there's three outcomes there from the prioritized outcome document. And on the right-hand side is the theme that's attached to that outcome, right? So if you wanna think in terms of like, you know, units or how you're gonna title a learning sequence with your students, well, what are we learning right now over time? Well, we're learning how to maximize challenge. We're learning about getting your daily dose. We're learning how to move to help manage our stress. But the outcome that we're teaching and assessing at the end of that learning sequence is on the left-hand side. So that's put together for you. Like I said, Lisa Smith and Sari GH had, had a huge part in putting both of those together. Um, so you could see how one marries to the other one um, and, and to help, again, your, your approach and your brainstorm and your thinking in, in taking this approach to teaching. Um, I'm gonna share that out with everybody at the end of the presentation. Okay, so we have our outcomes, right? We just went over that a little bit. The next thing I wanna get into is, is summative assessments, right? So while we talk about summative assessments, I wanna talk a little bit about teaching versus telling. How do we check ourselves and make sure that we're actually teaching kids things and we're not just telling them stuff? Because there are some parallels between the two, right? Um, what is a summative assessment? And then some very simple examples about um, from assessments and, and some summative examples. So teaching versus telling, right? How do we ensure we are teaching our students rather than simply telling or letting them know stuff? How do we build assessments to display learning and not recall or telling back, All right? And I believe in our discipline, like we get this, right? Because we don't give tests. We don't have standardized tests at the end of the school year. I feel like as health and physical education teachers, we get this. But at the same time, in my reflection, I always double check myself on this, that I'm not just telling them things, that I'm actually teaching them things that will transfer not only into their life now, but for the rest of their life, hopefully. And when we assess, how do we structure assessments that our kids aren't just telling us stuff back, right? Rizzuto told me this. So in the assessment, he asked me that. I'm just going to tell him that back, right? So what are we talking about there? We're talking about the application of the concepts that we're teaching. We want them to bring things back to us during the assessment in their own words, in their own language. And that also speaks to writing good essential questions, which again, we're going to talk about a little bit later, right? So teaching versus telling. I love reflecting on my teaching in this way. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of this before. I don't know how many of you have, but this is one of my favorite things. I teach a graduate level class at Adelphi University, and we just talked about this last night for like a half an hour, right? These three words. So we hear all the time, like student engagement, 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 engagement. Engagement's, gr engagement's great. Engagement's awesome. If we're teaching kids, our kids are engaged. One way that I gauge if my kids are truly engaged isn't by how they answer questions I guess to a degree, isn't necessarily based on the conversations that we have, I guess to a degree, but I really gauge engagement by what they ask me. The questions they ask me will tell me whether or not individual students, groups of students or classes are truly engaged in what we're doing that day. That's just one way. But what's better than engagement? If you look on the teaching side, empowerment, empowering our students to take ownership, to take accountability, to um, bring things to others, to bring things to other groups, to bring things to the school community, um, to bring things home, to transfer things into their everyday life. So we have engagement in the middle. Empowerment is the, is the bigger goal or a bigger goal. But on the other side, we have compliance. And sometimes compliance looks like, I don't know how to wear a good class or it looks like teaching. But really what is compliance, right? We ask our kids to do something and they do it. They don't give us a hard time. They engage in conversation. They answer questions. Maybe they ask some questions, but really all they're doing is what they think our expectation is of them. But are they truly engaged in the learning? And are we empowering them in any way, shape or form through what we do with them? And one of the, way that we, one of the ways that we could figure out what we're doing with our students, are they engaged, are they empowered, or are they just being compliant is what they give us back in assessment. Are they just retelling and recalling? Um, volleyball questioning. When I look at my classes, whether it's a PE class or a health class, I want my classes to symbolically, metaphorically look like a game of volleyball, not like a game ping pong. So again, good teaching on that teaching side. What does a game of volleyball look like? 
I ask a question, I throw a concept out there, multiple students bounce that question around, bounce that concept around before it comes back to me and I build on it, interject or we change course completely. Ping pong is I ask a question, Andrea answers it and we move on. I ask a question, Scott answers it and we move on, right? Volleyball, I ask a question, I throw a concept out there, Jessica has some input, Scott has some input, Andrea has some input, Lori has some input and then maybe it's time to bring it back to me, right? Volleyball goes over the net, bump, set, hit, comes over, bump, set, hit, goes back, right? Ping pong, me, you, me, you, me, you, right? So good teaching in a volleyball space, not a ping pong space. But then we have assessment on both sides, right? Like I said before, we have that recall, we have that telling back. If we're just telling our kids stuff, we, we could create assessments and just have them tell us stuff back. What are we optimizing the experience, right? So students don't tell us what we told them during the assessment. They apply it, they have new ideas that can still show us that they learned what we expected them to learn, but it's in their own words, from their own point of view, from their own perspective. So what is summative assessment? Summative assessments occur at the end of learning sequences or learn units like we talked about before and provide information on student performance, allowing you to summarize student progress by identifying strengths and areas for growth and providing guidance on next steps, right? Again, I talk about reflection. I talk about checking myself. When I create summative assessments, I'll go back to this definition. Is my assessment doing that? So there's other types of assessment. I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly. Um, I talk a lot and I just looked at the time. It's 11.22 already. Um, so we have informal, right? We're gathering information in an authentic way. We have formal, right? Standardized measures um, with predetermined criteria. And then we have our pre-assessment, right? We're giving at the beginning of a sequence and are used to develop a baseline and determine the impact. Okay. All of those definitions just came from the PE metrics, right? So I don't know if you have this text or not. Um, I have it. It's actually right over here. Um, it's a really good book, right? So I, uh, I encourage you to go and pick that up. So some examples of some assessments, right? Rubrics, rubrics outline expectations by identifying indicators of competency or communicating expectations through descriptors. Um, so standard three, developing a fitness plan example, right? So an indicator might be intensity levels aligned and are realistic for activity choice, right? Developing could be uh, intensity levels are either too high or too low for the activity choice. Uh, competent intensity levels are realistic and align with pre-assessment data. Proficient would be intensity levels are appropriately challenging. Intensity levels lead to improved performance. So we have our learning outcome. We have the power strip. Let's go into essential questions. Essential questions fit on that power strip really, really, really nicely. Um, so what are they? What do they do? How do we write them? And how can I become better at asking questions? All right, so what is an essential question? An essential question is an open-ended thought-provoking question that calls for higher order thinking and cannot be answered by recall alone. They point to transferable ideas, provoke more questions and require justification as they live or and they live over time. Um, just give me one second. I'm just gonna go open my door. It's getting really, really hot in here. Right. Sorry about that. So that's an essential question, right? Open-ended, thought-provoking, and they live over time. So what do essential questions do? Essential questions serve as an oak tree for students. A strong base with a variety of pathways for exploration throughout the sequence. They act as a constant point of reference. Essential questions keep your students thinking, questioning, and focused. So if we look at that oak tree, it's got that really strong base. But at the top of it, we could branch out in a million different directions. And that's what essential questions do. They have a strong foundation, a strong base. We're centered. But students' ideas, creativity, input, relevance can go in a million different ways. So how do we write essential questions? Well, I use this. Um, you could Google this. The first person I ever saw this from was Andy Milne and it works really, really well. So the left-hand side is a question starter, the first word in a question. The top is the second word in that question. Um, and if you look the top left-hand corner, what does or what is, is a pretty simple question to answer, right? So what is this or where is your bicep? Well, it's right here, boom, right answer, we move on. But if you work your way down to the bottom right-hand corner, those question starters help to frame essential questions a little bit better. And because I'm a little bit of a loser, um, those of you that know me know that I am, 
Um, there are times where I'll pull this up on my phone or my computer. I'll be sitting down watching a game or whatever. I'll be watching an Islander game. And in between periods, I'll pick a topic. And I'll work my way down the grid, trying to create better questions for that topic. So for example, solo taxonomy. What is solo taxonomy? Well, here's what it is. It's what it is. What does solo taxonomy, you know, fill in the blank? How might solo taxonomy improve or make learning more visible inside of a physical education class? It's a totally different question, much better question. Multiple ways you could answer that question. And still the question could be, the answer to the question could be correct, right? So I'm not telling you to pull this out um, and do that, but it, it, it's helped me not only write better essential questions, it's helped me be a better questioner in the moment during my classes, right? So for my closures, I don't script my closures. I have some things ready to go, but really my closures come from what happened during class. And this helped me to be better at that. So I told you empowerment was one of my favorite things to teach this year. So how might empowering those around us support our overall health and wellness? That was an essential question that I used during that learning sequence. Students asked that in a variety of different ways. Um, oh, all right, I already told you how I practice using the matrix. So our mastery objectives, right? Let's get into mastery objectives a little bit. Um, and I'm gonna, I might pick up the pace just a little bit um, so we could have some time for questions and conversation at the end if you have questions or if you wanna engage in conversation. So here's an objective um, from, from a class that I did this year. So the physically literate student or individual will be able to apply, active performance verb, the knowledge of trajectory into the billiards activity for today. So we wanna link the verbiage we want to um, understand that our mastery objectives can come from the three learning domains. If you read about mastery objectives, you'll read a lot about how mastery objectives aren't like activity-based and they're not, they're based in learning. For us, that learning can be psychomotor, affective or cognitive. Although the psychomotor domain does also lend itself to activity. But if you look at the grade level outcomes, psychomotor domain is part of our learning, right? Will Bodie, um, years ago said something to me, I might've been in a Voxer group, um, but movement is our text. And I love that, right? That quote, I don't know if he made it up or if he got it from somewhere else, but I'm giving him credit because that's who I heard it from. And then we have to make sure that the objective is attainable for our students, right? So we need to link the, ver the verbiage with our active performance verb. We have to understand that it could come from any of the three lear learning domains and it has to be attainable for our students. So we have our mastery objective. Um, Above the, the outlet, underneath the outlet, we have our formative assessment. So when we create formative assessments, what are we thinking about? What's our approach? Well, here's a checklist, right? So it aligns to the mastery objective. Just like on the macro side, am I sum my summative assessment, is it checking the outcome? Is my formative assessment checking the mastery objective? Formative assessment is not graded. It's for feedback, right? We don't grade the learning process. Um, it fuels adjustments made to instruction. So based on the information I get back from my students that could help me tweak my sequence as I go along, it, it could personalize lear, uh, learning in that same way, right? I could personalize learning to my students based on the feedback I'm getting back from my students based on what they show me that they learned or did not learn during the lesson. Um, and don't stress timelines. Um, when I first started teaching, I have you know nine classes or 12 classes for this and I'm gonna, I'm gonna start it here and I'm gonna end it here and that's it. One of the things that I've learned is to just kind of let learning occur, right? I have my block, it's gonna take eight classes, but you know what, based on the feedback I'm getting from my students, we need 10 now, or maybe we need seven now, right? Be ready to adjust on the fly. Um, I'm gonna hold the other piece until the end. And then in the, in the outlet, we have our what, why, how, right? Um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this graphic before, Joey Fight um, up in Canada made these, I use them. So what is what are we learning today? So an example of a what might be how tra trajectory can allow us to be successful in bowling. Um, where does the what, oh, sorry, where does the what come from? The what comes from the mastery objective, right? This is what they're learning today. I'm gonna put it in some more kid-friendly language. The why is all about relevance. So this quote at the beginning, I love this at the beginning, at the bottom, I love this quote. When the brain encounters information, especially during the act of reading and learning, it's searching for and making connections to what is personally relevant and meaningful. And every time we create a lesson under our learning sequence, we have to have relevance at the forefront of what we create. So an example, trajectory is used in a variety of games from many cultures, which could lead to a greater opportunity for movement 
as well as an increase in opportunities for social interaction, right? That's why we were learning that for that day. So that quote, I don't know if you have this book. Um, I'm not necessarily promoting the book. It's a great book, um, but that's where that quote came from. I believe it's right at the beginning of the book. I feel like it's in the first like 10 pages or something like that, uh, but culturally responsive teaching in the brain. So the how, how will I know that I've learned it? So an example, how did, and I'm gonna get back to that in a second, how did utilizing trajectory allow you to find success in today's bowling activity? So here's what I wanna point out with the how, right? So the how aligns with the formative assessment, right? The what to the mastery objective, the how to the formative assessment, but I don't know how many of you do this. When I started framing my hows as questions, they became much better. Right? So how will I know that I learned it? Well, can you do this? Or how did you do that? Right? So when I started framing my hows as questions, they became much better. I got a lot more and a lot more appropriate, a lot more authentic, a lot more meaningful information for my students. Um, all right, so I do wanna go back to one thing really quickly. Um, and it was in the relevance piece. So when we create relevant learning experiences for our students, right? We obviously want things that are transferable. We want them to be able to see it now and for the rest of their life, right? We want it to be relevant for them now, but they could also see the relevance for them for the rest of their life. Um, check in with relevance, poll your students, ask your students if what we just learned, if what we've learned so far, if this class, whether it's health or PE, if they feel like it's relevant to them, and the kids who don't feel like it's relevant to them, follow up with. Student voice is really, really important. When I first got to the district that I'm in, some of the feedback that I got from students was that they would have rather taken another AP class than PE because they didn't think it was meaningful or relevant to them. They felt like they were just going and playing games and wasting time. And then when we kind of shifted gears a little bit and we created more relevant experiences, those kids, they didn't want to take another AP class because this was valuable. What they were learning was valuable and they were getting the play. So PE became much more important to them and much more important for them because it became much more important to them. Okay. Um, I wanted to leave about 10 minutes at the end for questions and we're right around that time. Questions and conversation if you want to have some. Um, but you could always contact me, residuoeducation at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter at Rizzuto Ed. Um, I haven't been as active on Twitter this year as I don't think a lot of us have because of like just COVID stuff. Um, but hopefully in September, I'll be back to as being as active as I, uh, as I used to be. Um, I apologize that I rushed a little bit, but like I said, at the end of the shape presentation, there was a lot of conversation. So I wanted to give us some ample time for you to share with the group, maybe some uh, approaches that you take with the backwards design model, questions that you may have about what I presented or anything you wanna discuss. So at this point, you guys can go ahead and unmute yourselves and have a conversation. Um, I'm going to stop my share. Too. So we did get Charlie just something, uh, Bo asking to share the book slide again. The book slide? Sure. No problem. All right. I suggest taking a picture of it. Yeah. That's what I did. Culturally responsive teaching in the brain. Thanks, Jeff. You're welcome, Bo. I got you. <laughs> I'm sorry. My uh, son just needed help, so I walked away, and then I come back. <laughs> That's okay. Hey, Charlie, really good stuff, man. Uh, keep it up. All right. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions or anything that they want to talk about? Um, Charlie, I have a question. Um, what helps you or other PE teachers, I guess, stay consistent with using that sequence? I mean, I know I use like a Google Doc and kind of copy it, but what helps you stay consistent throughout the year? So um, are you talking about like organizationally? Yeah, and just being able to like, start well, but also, you know, in May, still be using that consistent lesson structure and um, like planning method? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So um, I'm going to answer it in a few different ways. So first, what we have is our curriculum is a live document. So it's a Google document shared out with the entire department. And we have conversations about our curriculum as a whole fairly consistently, right? Fairly often. Like, what do we want to change? What, 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 what do we want to tweak? Things of that nature. What, what do we want to add? 
Um, so our curriculum isn't something that we revisit every few years. Our curriculum is something that we're constantly having conversations about. And like I said, it's a live document shared through the department. So if we have a conversation about something and I'm like, hey, you know, I'm going to go into the document. I'm going to adjust that really fast. It's done and it's done for everybody. And I think keeping your curriculum at the forefront, keeping the curriculum in conversation helps keep you focused on how you create learning sequence. And then the other piece that I would say is, and I know this is really hard, um, put time into your weekly schedule. I would say daily, but sometimes that's really hard, but at least your weekly schedule for reflection. And if you're reflecting on what you're doing, what you're teaching and how you created that sequence for your students, like that's one of the reasons why in the presentation I kept putting like checklists or checkpoints or, or points of reference for me, right? Here's how I make sure that my summative assessment is actually a summative assessment. Here's how I make sure that I'm doing this appropriately. If you could create something like that for yourself, I used to have it, um, I have a, a filing cabinet over there. I used to have it stuck to the side. And when I got finished or as I was creating learning sequences, I would just use it and I would make sure, hey, here's my point of reference. Here's my checklist. Here are my checkpoints. Is this what I'm doing? Is this my approach to what I'm creating? And if I get sidetracked from that, I have something right in front of me to put me back on task, right? Um, because I was rushing a little bit, I didn't mention this before, but your question um, is perfect for me to throw this in there. So what, in the backwards design model, we start with the end in mind, we have the grade level outcome, we create the summative assessment, we create the essential question, and then we start creating lessons, right? So sometimes it works really well where I create the last lesson, the second to last lesson, boom, 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 all the way back to the first. What I usually do though, as I'm creating a learning sequence, a new learning sequence with something I haven't taught before or I'm uh, adjusting a learning sequence I already have in place, is I just create lessons. And then almost like pieces to a puzzle, I start putting them where they fit, right? And then um, again, constantly double checking where does this fit into the timeline of what it is I'm trying to teach? Can they, does this lesson help them explore that essential question, right? Because that essential question brings us through the whole sequence. So does this lesson, is this lesson a piece to them further exploring and trying to answer that question. Because part of my summative assessments, uh, let me rephrase that. The essential question is always a part of my summative assessment. We answer it as we go and discuss it as we go, but then at the end, okay, now answer it. And that's always part of the sum of assessment. And those individual lessons, again, I'll create six, seven, eight lessons, whatever it is. And then I start putting them in the timeline of where I think they fit best always double checking that that lesson could help them explore and answer that essential question. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that definitely helps. Okay. So thank you. All right. I saw somebody raise their hand, but it went away. Uh, it's Elise. I, oh, hey, Elise. Hey. Um, so my, my question is, and this is like a, something that I always think about when it comes to secondary, is that oftentimes secondary classes are multi-age levels. So they have different grades in them. So when you construct a curriculum using backwards design, um, you know, it, there, are those kids getting the same curriculum three, four years in a row? And what do you, if not, like, what are you doing? How are you mitigating that process? And like, what stakeholders did you have to get on board to yeah. make those changes? So that's a great question. Um, I love that question. So here's my answer. And if I don't answer it as well as you want me to, just, just, just tell me and, and we'll keep talking. So what we created in our curriculum, like our school colors are purple and gold, right? Mm -hmm. Our PE classes are split up ninth, 10th grade, 11th and 12th grade, right? We have seventh grade, eighth grade, 9, 10, 11, 12, right? PE one, PE two. In our curriculum, we have purple years and gold years. So when we're in a purple year, the ninth and 10th grade PE class is following the purple curriculum, grade levels, activities, because we also try to differentiate the activity throughout high school, right? So they're not playing the same games and doing the same activities all four years. We want the learning to be different all four years. So a purple year in ninth and 10th grade, these are the grade level outcomes. And now that we have the new state standards, it's even easier for us. We have to rewrite some things now, but it's even easier for us. But when we were using the national outcomes, here are the outcomes that we're, that we're addressing. Here's what we're teaching. Here are the activities that we're going to use as the vehicles to teach those outcomes. 
11th and 12th grade has their purple year curriculum. Then the next year we switch to a gold year curriculum. And then we go back to purple and then back to gold. So if you come in as a freshman, purple year curriculum, ninth and 10th grade, you're getting this. Gold year curriculum, ninth and 10th grade, you're getting this. Now you're in the 11th and 12th grade PE2 class, purple year, but it's different stuff still. Purple year, gold year. So that's how we constructed our curriculum to make sure that each year the learning is different and the activities are different. Activity-wise, there's some overlap, um, but also <laughs> to elaborate a little further, I know like in the shape document, the language is for the levels, right? So it's level one and level two at the high school, right? If uh, a student has addressed or achieved level one, move them on to level two. Our state has ours constructed where level one is ninth and 10th grade stuff. Level two is 11th and 12th grade stuff. So that's also how we, we kind of broke down the outcomes. So was this uh, like a program you inherited as you uh, worked, like as a, got a job there or was that something that you built? We built it. So when you got there, the, like it, it was, it was all nine, it was activity based. Grade so when I got there, ninth and 10th grade were still split, but everything was activity based. Um, and the curriculum was essentially just a list of, it was basketball, football, soccer, whatever, just a list of stuff. Um, grading was on participation. Like that's what it was. Yeah, I just want to be careful because sometimes when we get into these like pedagogy things and we start talking about backwards design, we like as people that care about this kind of stuff, we forget that like some people have systemic things that like prevent them from being able to do this. So I think in some of these conversations, it's important to maybe identify what steps need to be taken first before it, because like the high school from the district that I teach in is ninth, and, ninth through 12th graders all take class together. So right. like, what can we do? What can we do to get ourselves to the place where we can make a backward design program that is different from year to year? I, I don't mean to take over your presentation. It's just like something that I think about, like yeah. when we see these things and like, I feel like from New York, especially, we are way more privileged than we realize because physical education is super valued in New York. And that's not, when I go to other places and see that like kids only need to take phys ed for one quarter their entire high school career. It's mm. like, it changes your perspective on like these concepts of, of backward design sometimes because like we, we're thinking we have four years with them as New Yorkers, but if you go to some other states, they have eight weeks over four years, you know, so right. eight times four. So like, I just wanna like make sure that we're identifying that you and I are coming from a place of privilege where we have lots of time with these kids. And when we're, we're creating these curricular, when we're creating these curricular documents, it, it comes, it does come from a certain place in a system. So no, that's, out there. no, 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 that's, that's, that's great feedback. So like I said, I, I took some of what was in the bigger presentation out. It wasn't exactly what you were alluding to, but it was the purple year, gold year um, construct that we put together, but you're right. Like, um, there are places where they only have eight weeks of PE, right? So what are they going to do in those eight weeks? How are they going to use that model? And their experiences and, and, and what they have available to them isn't the same as what we have here in New York in terms of if you just want to start off with time, right? Um, so yeah, I'm going, to take, I'm going to take that, reflect on it, put that stuff back in the presentation, but also see how I can make it more applicable to more people across the country. That's really good input. You always have great insight. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, I put down your book uh, on my list, by the way. I, that one was not on my list yet. Yeah, no, that's a good the, one. Uh, yeah. Culture responsive. So thanks for that. <laughs> yes. Hey, Charlie, quick question. Uh, what do you think uh, empowering the high What do you think of the, the, the number one thing that you've done this year that really helped them out? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear some of your question. Never mind. It's just like, what do you do for empowering your, your high school students? What do you think is number one? The most important thing that I do with my high school kids? Yeah. So to, em to empower them, I think he added. To empower them? Okay. So at the beginning, so the first thing that I do when we started talking about empowerment 
was we talked about what um, empowerment could mean for them, right? And, and what we, the conversations that we ended up having was differentiating between something that was purely or solely motivational and something that could be empowering, right? And then we started to unpack and, and, and dissect and, and, and define what empowerment means and what does it mean to be empowered? How could we empower other people? But everything in my PE class, no matter what it is that I'm teaching, and this really lends itself to empowerment as well, is um, the social emotional environment that we create, right? The class culture that we create. So everything that we did in terms of empowerment stemmed from that class culture, right? The social elements of, of movement, the social elements of physical activity and how that transfers into your everyday life. And then the emotional pieces, right? So kind of what Elise alluded to, we could talk about physical education across the country, but we also, well, we also know really, really well that everything Elise alluded to exists inside each one of our classes no matter where we teach, no matter what age level that we teach and starting to cr create um, opportunities for some of those conversations to occur in an appropriate way and come to the forefront was a really valuable piece to differentiating, identifying and empowering or how to empower uh, the kids in each individual class. Um, does that answer your question? So in terms of the approach to what we did, we started there because oftentimes I feel like in my experiences anyway, kids look at something that's motivational and they confuse it with something that's empowering when, so when we started the learning sequence, the first thing we did was differentiate between the two and try to bring that to the forefront. So Charlie, um, are you gonna have these slides available for participants at all? Yes, just tell me how you want me to make those available. So um, if you get them to me, so at the end of the workshop, uh, in your emails, you will be getting a link to the EPEW resource document. So Charlie's slide deck will be in that and anything else that he wants to get out to you guys um, that you've asked, we'll make sure to get put in there. So again, you're not gonna get that till the end of the workshop because it's gonna have it from all of the presenters that we have. Um, and that way it will all be in one spot, nice and tidy spot for you guys to get. Uh, Anything else? Any last words you want, Charlie, or any last minute questions? Because we are at time. Yeah, so the, the only other thing that I would throw in there, right? So not only as a teacher do I reflect, as a, pre, as a presenter I reflect. So please, any feedback that you have, great, awful, or in between, um, email me and let me know. So Elise, I, again, I appreciate your, your question, not only as a question, but also as feedback, right? Thank you. Yeah. No problem. My pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also was actually wondering, as you were talking about empowerment, because I was thinking about this last night, actually, um, like, do you put out a student survey about, like, you know, what activities they want to learn these things through and, like, do like give them an options of, like, things that they'll know and then maybe give them options of things that they don't know what like have heard of and then like some way out their options and survey for which yeah. ones so i've like, done that a few different ways so i've given a blanket survey mm -hmm. right so what are things that you enjoy playing right and like i said i try to change the activity every day so we can incorporate those things in there as we're presenting new activities to them throughout the course of a learning sequence or a school year and I've, get, I've structured it as, so in the curriculum, here are all the activities that we have ready to go. And here are activities that you might already know that can marry well with that. So for example, if I'm going to teach netball, I might start with basketball and just slowly change rules and elements of the game until now we're playing netball. I, if I wanna use rugby, I might start with football and slowly change it and turn it into rugby over time. Um, so I've constructed it in that way, like, so if, Rugby is, or they've probably never heard of netball before. So if netball is kind of like basketball, um, order these in things you might want to, um, or be most likely to want to play to least likely to want to play, right? And, and things of that nature. Um, I've never structured it the way that you just outlined it or laid it out, but that could be a really good way that um, you could structure it. And I might do that this year. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering like what kind of impact that might have on like, you saying, I'm definitely gonna teach these five things throughout the year, but these other six things, I'm gonna leave it up to the students in each class. So you give them an option of like 15 things and the top six choices are the other things that end up getting taught throughout the year or something. Yeah. It was just a little thought experiment that I was Yeah, thinking. so no, that way I, I have kind of done it. And in our curriculum, 
So I said before, we differentiate activity all the way through, right? But the activities that we have on our curriculum are so plentiful that there's more activities in there than we have time to teach for the most part. Like there's a whole bunch in there. Um, mm -hmm. And we also infuse from time to time, like I said, we'll use this traditional one to get to something that's a little bit more unique. So there is opportunity for choice and student voice in what's already written into the curriculum as well, if that makes right. sense. But it also, we have to also look at the fact that like the, the list comes from your white male identity, right? So like the things that are being put on the list are also coming from a certain space. I'm just like analyzing, like I have to yeah. stop judging. Like I'm just like going no, through. No, no, I know. But the list so, in the curriculum also comes from the students. So previous student mm -hmm. voice was brought into the curriculum when we wrote it, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. So it comes from us as a staff, but also surveys and polling that we had done with our kids over time. And also just teaching them, you get to learn, hey, they really like this, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then another, and I didn't mention this, but another uh, survey that I've done with my students was culturally based. So where where is your heritage and what do they play, right? So I had a student um, a few years ago that brought a game to class, right? We played it, um, it was culturally relevant to them and we added it to the curriculum as an option or, or an opportunity. Um, for uh, movement. Cool. I never know how to end this. That was a very good academic in like conversation we just had. Yeah, <laughs> so let's keep having them. Okay, so we have got to wrap up to get um, everyone time to do like quick little breaks before our next sessions that are gonna hit. Again, go back to our website to get more information. The, epew-cp.weebly.com um, and check your emails for all the things for the other sessions. Again, today at 11 o'clock, we have our demo slam. Again, Pacific times, 11 o'clock demo slam. Um, three o'clock is our goose chase social, um, goose chase slash kahoot with Jen Mettler. And yeah, we cannot wait to see you guys as the week continues. Thanks for joining our EPW family. And thank you, Charlie, so much for like, I have like tons of notes written on this one. So killer presentation. Thanks. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Good job, Charlie. Thank you for attending the 48th Annual Elementary Physical Education Workshop. We're glad you were here. Please follow us on our social media platforms EPEW can be found on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Please check out our website for links to more great sessions. Just go to epew-cp.weebly.com and click on the virtual EPEW 2021 tab at the top and scroll down. EPEW 2021 Educators Assemble would not be possible without the support and dedication from the amazing EPW committee. The committee has been hard at work for months preparing for this workshop. Thank you to Linda McGee, Barbara Gratton, Scott Wilson, Stephanie Sandino, Julie Miller, Jessica Monlux, Kayla Aylman, Shelby Lozano, Andrea Chavez, Scott Townsend, and Cindy Chase. Thank you for attending EPEW, where our motto is, come to learn, leave as family.